Hello, good evening. How are you? Hello, teacher. Hello, Katya. How are you? How have you been doing? Hi, good Hi, evening. Hi, Sarah. How are you? Fine, thank you. And you? Fine, thank you for asking. Okay, thank you for coming early. Let's wait for a little bit before sharing the information, before sharing the, the practice for for today, the, the answers, right, for <laughs> yesterday's practice. So, um, did you practice your listening? How did you feel the listening yesterday? Uh, yesterday, it was interesting because it's my favorite part because in my job, I practice English every day. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. So, uh, so for you, it was kind of easy to understand and listening and everything, right? Yes, it's more easy for me and than that, uh, that reading or speaking. Yes, exactly. It's it's it, it, speaking is kind of difficult, but it will help you, right? If you practice with your a reading skill, listening also, uh, it will help you also with speaking and writing. So really good. And you, Katya, how, how do you feel it? Yes. <laughs> yes. How do you feel it, Katya? It was easy, it was difficult, it was more or less? It was more or less, teacher. No, too easy. Not and, too easy, uh-huh. Yes, but I like too much. Uh, listening that uh, reading I prefer that. listening and reading oh, yes exactly so yes if you practice with one thing it will help you to for example your listening skills your reading your writing your speaking because you will increase your knowledge okay so we are going to wait just a little bit because I don't want to 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 start like providing the answers before other people uh, before sharing the information uh, without being there, without being here, right? So uh, yesterday we were checking. This will be the 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 answers, right? Or these are the questions that you were supposed to to answer yesterday. Good evening, Marielos. Thank you for coming. Good evening, teacher. Okay, thank you for coming. Uh, so this will be the practice too. We are going to have other two practices like lectures. And if we still have time, if we still have time, we are going to have conversations, okay? Because lectures are different than conversation. Okay. Conversations will be, for example, like a problem in the university or a, a student talking to a teacher, something like that. But lectures are more related to um, to classes or this kind of, of knowledge, right? That they try to transmit, like the ones that we had yesterday. So, uh, what was the listening about yesterday? Do you remember it? Do you do you remember the, the listening? Ah, uh, the last one. Mm -hmm. Last one. Uh, it was about the population uh, increased. Yes, the increased in the population. Right. Mm -hmm. We have this lecture here, and it was about um. Yeah, this one is lecture number three. So this is the lecture that we that we were listening to yesterday about population growth, right? Uh, you don't. Uh, do you want to listen to it again, or it's not necessary? Oh, please. <laughs> <laughs> you want yes. to listen to it again? Yes, please. Okay, but you already answered the questions, right? You you already yes. answered, right? Okay. Yes. So we are going just to listen, just to remember. And after we have listened to it, we are going to share the response. And you let me know yeah. how much uh, or how many you have uh, good or bad or which ones. So we will be able to check that. And we are going to have two more lectures and conversations. So we are uh, in the meantime that everybody arrives, we are going to listen to it just one more time. It just lasts uh, three minutes. Okay. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. Let's listen to it. Good morning, everyone. Now in today's lesson, I'd like to talk about population growth and in particular, fertility rate. Now can anyone here define fertility rate? Uh, is it the number of births in a population measured per thousand people per year? 
Oh, uh, no, that's what we call the birth rate, the number of children born in a year per thousand people. No, the fertility rate is the average number of children born per woman in her lifetime, that is, if she lives beyond her childbearing years. Now, do you think the British fertility level is higher or lower than it was, say, 20 years ago? I think it's lower, because these days women are far more focused on their careers than they used to be. Well, that point is certainly true, but actually, fertility levels in Britain are relatively high at the moment. In 2008, it was 1.96. That means that on average, each woman gives birth to 1.96 children, and in 2009, it was only slightly lower at 1.94. The last time fertility rates were this high was back in 1973. In the UK currently, the highest rate of fertility is in Northern Ireland, where the rate is 2.04, and the lowest is in Scotland, where the rate is just 1.77. I don't understand. How come fertility rate is going up? Women are just as career-driven these days as they were 30 years ago. Well, the reason is that during the 1990s, women really started to delay having families, and that was the reason for the decrease in birth rate then. Now those women are in their 30s and early 40s, and they are starting to have families. So that's why the birth rate is going up. Oh, I see. So it's not actually as if people are actively choosing to have more children than they used to. Yes, that's right, Charlene. The number of children per family is continuing to fall. Women who are currently in their 70s had an average of 2.4 children. Those in their 60s had 2.2, those in their 50s had 2.0, and the current figure is 1.9. Actually, this figure isn't due to more families choosing to have only one child, although that certainly is occurring. It's mainly because of the increasing number of women who have no children at all. This figure was 1 in 10 among the age group who are now 65, but now 1 in 4 women in their mid-40s are childless. I heard that the fertility rate in Europe is like really low, 1.3 or something. That's right, Charlene, it is. It's far below the replacement level. Can you tell me what replacement level means? No, it's the number of births you need to keep the population constant. Yes, I heard that in France they're trying to get people to have more children. They even give out gold medals if you have eight. That's right. So we've already mentioned that women are waiting before having children because of their careers. Why else is fertility rate generally decreasing? I think they have fewer children because they're so expensive. I mean, I heard one report that said it costs 200,000 pounds a year to raise a child here. But I find that difficult to believe. People's standard of living is far higher now than it used to be a hundred years ago when families had eight or nine kids. That's very true, but these days people's expectations tend to be higher. <coughs> Parents want their children to have the best opportunities in life, so they're prepared to pay to develop their children's talents. Yes, I heard that in China, where they're easing off some of the rules of the one-child policy and allowing some couples to have two, many parents are still choosing to have one. They say it's just too expensive. But, you know, I reckon that with all this parental micromanagement that's going on these days, parents only have the time to manage one or two children. That's a good point. So now I'd like to look at some different organizations and examine what they believe about the current population issues. Popul good morning, everyone. Now in today's... Okay, perfect. So as you can see, they speak really fast. And this was the, the listening for yesterday, right? Yesterday's listening. So they speak really fast and even, and also the, the vocabulary is not that easy, right? So we are going to answer the questions. Thank you for coming, Sirhan and Nelsi. Thank you for being early at the class. So let's see right now. Okay, just let me know if you have the correct answers, right? We have only six, so we are going to check it right now. Number one, which of the following is defined as the number of children born per 1,000 people per year? The correct one was birth rate, right? That is the defined as the number of children born per 1,000 per year. Number two, which of the following countries in the UK has the highest fertility rate is Northern Ireland, right? Northern Ireland, very good. Three, why is the fertility rate in the UK higher than it was 20 years ago? Women who delayed childbirth are having children now. So that is the reason, right? And the last two, um, 
oh sorry the last three what portion of women in their mid 40s do not have children nowadays 40 percent i'm not sorry 25 percent. 25 percent is the correct one and number five what do french couples who have eight children receive they receive gold medals right gold medals and number six which of the reasons for low fertility rates is not mentioned people want to enjoy their lives before taking on responsibility so those were the correct answers okay you are going to have these answers also uh, in the presentation so how many uh, did you have correct katya Uh, I have two teachers. Three. Okay. So, so very good. Marielos, how many do you have? Only three teachers. Only three. I, okay. I, I had a problem with uh, with your screen. I couldn't share <laughs> the last one. The last one. Okay. <laughs> yes, but it's, uh, it's good. Okay. Very good. But three is okay. Nelsie, okay. uh, how many did you have correct? no one <laughs> none okay none of them okay so we need to practice a little bit more okay sir hannah how many did you have correct uh 10 uh, uh, 10 is only six but... <laughs> no only four <laughs> only four okay that's good that's good four it's okay and sarah how many did you have okay Okay, teacher, I have a problem with okay. my with my internet. I can hear all the example. You couldn't hear all, all the all the listening. Yes. Okay, but yesterday, uh, did you answer any of the questions yesterday? Um. Yeah. Yes. Okay, and do you have any correct one with the the answers that you had? Any correct answer? Yesterday I have uh, seven. Seven from the last, from the previous round, right? Okay, perfect, perfect. That's good. That's good. That's a, that's a good punctuation. So we are going to listen today two other lectures. Vamos a escuchar otras dos clases, and then we are going to listen to, I guess, two conversations. I get that. I guess that we will have. Um, we will have time for two conversations. Let's see here. Some people have problems with the internet, they say. So probably that's the reason because it's raining. So if you have any problem, uh, just let me know, okay? But it seems that we have uh, some problems with the rest of the group, unfortunately. But today we are going to continue with uh, lecture number three and lecture number four, okay? Let's see, lecture number three. Okay, this lecture is about facial recognition. Uh, are you familiar with these terms, facial recognition? It's like biometrics, right? Facial recognition, when they recognize your face, for example, your cell phone, right? Can do that, right? Sometimes when you, okay. uh, it recognizes yeah. your face, it opens up, right? It, it, it unlocks. So we are going to listen to this. It it takes only three minutes and 28 seconds. And I will play it twice. This lecture and the other lecture, I will play it twice. But the conversation, I will play just one, okay? Just once, okay? okay. We have Miguel also. Thank yeah. you for coming, Miguel. And Sergio, thank you for coming, Sergio. Okay, we are about to start. Um, if you uh, were not here before, uh, these were the, the answers for yesterday's listening. It was number one, it was a birth rate. So check it if you have it correct. Number two is Northern Ireland, the correct one. Number three was um, women who delay childbirth are having children now. And this one is 25%, number five is gold medals, and number six is people want to endure their lives before taking on responsibility. So those were the answers, so you can check yourselves. Um, 
we are going to start right now with uh, the, the, the lecture for today, right? The listening for today. Are you ready? Yes, teacher. Okay, now let's listen, okay? Let's focus. Hello, class. So today we're going to be looking at facial recognition and to the different sorts of technology that go into facial recognition. Now before we start, can any of you tell me where we can see facial recognition in action? Yes, you at the back? In the TV show Las Vegas? <laughs> <laughs> well, you're right. In this popular TV show, the security team pull images of the individuals from their surveillance system and run the image through a database to identify the person. In that way, all the card counters and blacklisted gamblers can be escorted from the poker tables. It looks easy on TV, but in the real world, facial recognition is a tricky business. So let's start with the more traditional methods of facial recognition. Every face has peaks and valleys, and these can be translated into what is termed as nodal points. Each face has about 80 of these, and they include distance between the eyes, the length of the jaw, the width of the nose, things like that. These measurements can be used to create a numerical code, and this is called a face print. This system is good because it can compare two-dimensional images, such as photographs, the problem is that images have to be controlled. The person has to be staring straight at the camera. There must be no variance in facial expression or lighting because any variance in these parameters reduces the effectiveness of the system. So they had to come up with another way. So the new way of recognizing faces is by using a 3D model. It has better accuracy allegedly. 3D imagery detects distinctive features in the face such as the curves of the eyes, nose and chin features which do not change over time. These are measured at the submillimeter level. Interestingly, a 3D image can be taken not only from a live scan but also from a 2D photograph. And another good thing about the 3D system is that it can recognize a person from a range of angles. The person doesn't have to be directly facing the camera as in 2D technology. Once again, the system gives each individual a unique code, a set of numbers that represents the face. It's easy to match a 3D image to another 3D image if you already have a 3D image in your database. It's less easy to match 3D images to 2D images. But what they can do is pull certain measurements from the 3D image, such as the eye and so forth, and use this to convert the 3D image into a 2D image, and this image can be more easily compared to the 2D images in the database. But it's not just the measurements which can be used to recognize faces. There's also a new development called skin biometrics. This uses the uniqueness of skin texture to get its results. The process takes a picture of a patch of skin and the system will then identify any pores, lines, moles, blemishes, and other features of skin texture. This method can be used to identify identical twins, something that cannot be done with the 3D technology. Its other advantages over 3D imagery are that it's insensitive to changes in expression blinking, smiling, and so forth, and can compensate for changes in facial features, such as the growth of a beard or wearing glasses. It's not perfect, though, as it is sensitive to lighting conditions and poor camera resolution, and if there is glare from the sun. So, now we've covered the main types of facial recognition, we'll move on to its uses. Now, has anybody here... Okay, perfect. Um... Were you able to listen to it? Yes. Yes. Do you want to listen to it again or that's enough? No, again, teacher. Again? Okay. Yes. Okay, perfect. Right. So we are going to listen to it again. Remember that it is about facial recognition. Take notes, okay? If it is possible, uh, we already <clears throat> learned how to take notes. So if it is possible for you, take notes. Okay, let's again, play it. Teacher. Okay, let's play it again. Hello, class. So today we're going to be looking at facial recognition and to the different sorts of technology that go into facial recognition. Now, before we start, can any of you tell me where we can see facial recognition in action? Yes, you at the back? In the TV show Las Vegas? <laughs> <laughs> well, you're right. In this popular TV show, the security team pull images of the individuals from their surveillance system and run the image through a database to identify the person. In that way, all the card counters and blacklisted gamblers can be escorted from the poker tables. 
It looks easy on TV, but in the real world, facial recognition is a tricky business. So let's start with the more traditional methods of facial recognition. Every face has peaks and valleys, and these can be translated into what is termed as nodal points. Each face has about 80 of these, and they include distance between the eyes, the length of the jaw, the width of the nose, things like that. These measurements can be used to create a numerical code, and this is called a face print. This system is good because it can compare two-dimensional images, such as photographs. The problem is that images have to be controlled. The person has to be staring straight at the camera. There must be no variance in facial expression or lighting because any variance in these parameters reduces the effectiveness of the system. So they had to come up with another way. So the new way of recognizing faces is by using a 3D model. It has better accuracy allegedly. 3D imagery detects distinctive features in the face such as the curves of the eyes, nose and chin, features which do not change over time. These are measured at the submillimeter level. Interestingly, a 3D image can be taken not only from a live scan, but also from a 2D photograph. And another good thing about the 3D system is that it can recognize a person from a range of angles. The person doesn't have to be directly facing the camera as in 2D technology. Once again, the system gives each individual a unique code, a set of numbers that represents the face. It's easy to match a 3D image to another 3D image if you already have a 3D image in your database. It's less easy to match 3D images to 2D images, but what they can do is pull certain measurements from the 3D image, such as the eye and so forth, and use this to convert the 3D image into a 2D <coughs> image, and this image can be more easily compared to the 2D images in the database. But it's not just the measurements which can be used to recognize faces. There's also a new development called skin biometrics. This uses the uniqueness of skin texture to get its results. The process takes a picture of a patch of skin and the system will then identify any pores, lines, moles, blemishes, and other features of skin texture. This method can be used to identify identical twins, something that cannot be done with the 3D technology. Its other advantages over 3D imagery are that it's insensitive to changes in expression blinking, smiling, and so forth, and can compensate for changes in facial features, such as the growth of a beard or wearing glasses. It's not perfect, though, as it is sensitive to lighting conditions and poor camera resolution, and if there is glare from the sun. So, now we've covered the main types of facial recognition, we'll move on to its uses. Now, has anybody here... Okay, perfect. Did you take notes? Yes. Yes, okay, perfect. I have no. problems with my energy in my house. I don't have connection for a moment. You don't have connection? No, it's uh, intermittent. Yes, teacher, sorry, but I don't know what happened with the internet, but I have an issue with my with the connection. I don't know what happened. Yes, it is true. There is like a problem with the internet around days, right? Because it's, it's raining. raining really strong. It's, it's raining. raining very hard. Yes, very heavily. Sorry for that. Um, were you able to listen to all of the lecture? Did you listen to it? No. No. Because I can I can hear you for for part, but I can hear you, and yes, I can hear you. Okay. Sometimes you can hear me. Sometimes you is there is like an interruption, right? interruption do you want to listen to it again just the last time just in case or no miguel yes. one, one more time one more time to the class right yes. now one more time, teacher. Oh. yes lady just connected right you didn't have issues have issues with the internet also right lady yes okay yes i will play it again because we are studying i think that we have time Okay, this is about facial recognition. <laughs> Remember to take notes, people, okay? Remember to take notes about the listening. Um, let me see here. I will play it again. And let me see. Yes, I will play it again for you to listen, okay? okay. Let's see. Hello, class. 
So today we're going to be looking at facial recognition and to the different sorts of technology that go into facial recognition. Now before we start, can any of you tell me where we can see facial recognition in action? Yes, you at the back? In the TV show Las Vegas? <laughs> <laughs> well, you're right. In this popular TV show, the security team pull images of the individuals from their surveillance system and run the image through a database to identify the person. In that way, all the card counters and blacklisted gamblers can be escorted from the poker tables. It looks easy on TV, but in the real world, facial recognition is a tricky business. So let's start with the more traditional methods of facial recognition. Every face has peaks and valleys, and these can be translated into what is termed as nodal points. Each face has about 80 of these, and they include distance between the eyes, the length of the jaw, the width of the nose, things like that. These measurements can be used to create a numerical code and this is called a face print. This system is good because it can compare two-dimensional images such as photographs. The problem is that images have to be controlled. The person has to be staring straight at the camera. There must be no variance in facial expression or lighting because any variance in these parameters reduces the effectiveness of the system. So they had to come up with another way. So, the new way of recognizing faces is by using a 3D model. It has better accuracy, allegedly. 3D imagery detects distinctive features in the face, such as the curves of the eyes, nose, and chin, features which do not change over time. These are measured at the submillimeter level. Interestingly, a 3D image can be taken not only from a live scan, but also from a 2D photograph. And another good thing about the 3D system is that it can recognize a person from a range of angles. The person doesn't have to be directly facing the camera as in 2D technology. Once again, the system gives each individual a unique code, a set of numbers that represents the face. It's easy to match a 3D image to another 3D image if you already have a 3D image in your database. It's less easy to match 3D images to 2D images, but what they can do is pull certain measurements from the 3D image, such as the eye and so forth, and use this to convert the 3D image into a 2D image, and this image can be more easily compared to the 2D images in the database. But it's not just the measurements which can be used to recognize faces. There's also a new development called skin biometrics. This uses the uniqueness of skin texture to get its results. The process takes a picture of a patch of skin and the system will then identify any pores, lines, moles, blemishes, and other features of skin texture. This method can be used to identify identical twins, something that cannot be done with the 3D technology. Its other advantages over 3D imagery are that it's insensitive to changes in expression, blinking, smiling, and so forth, and can compensate for changes in facial features, such as the growth of a beard or wearing glasses. It's not perfect, though, as it is sensitive to lighting conditions and poor camera resolution, and if there is glare from the sun. So, now we've covered the main types of facial recognition, we'll move on to its uses. Now, has anybody here... Hello? Okay, perfect. Now it's time to answer, right? Time for the questions. If you take Ooh. notes, you, you can use them, okay? No problem. Yes. Now the questions for the practice number three. Mm -hmm. Number one, where does the TV show Las Vegas take place? In a shopping mall, in a police department, in a casino, in a crime lab. Number two, what is face print? A, a code which identifies a face. B, distinctive curves in the face. C, a 2D image of the face. D, <laughs> No, the number of a nodal points on the face. Okay. Number three, let's see number three. Identify two problems with 2D facial recognition from the list below. It is not effective if a picture is dark. B, the person in the photograph must face the camera. C, facial curves change over time. D, nodal points cannot be measured. Choose the correct one, please. Number four, what is the problem with the 3D technology? It can only be used when the individual is directly facing the camera. B, the image might change over time. C, 
it's impossible to match a 3D image to a 2D image. D, it cannot distinguish between identical twins. Choose the correct one, please. Okay, did you choose it already? Yes, yes right? Exactly. Yes. Let's see, I think we have two more. Five, which two elements below can be measured by skin biometric technology? A, the curve of someone's chin. B, the texture of someone's skin. C, the existence of lines on the face. D, the distance between the eyes. Six, which of these faces will the skin biometric system be unable to identify? A, B, C, or D? Choose the correct answers, please. Okay, did you finish? Yes. Perfect. Now we are going to uh, check the answers, no, okay? No, no, number number six. Number six? Which? Yes, number six, you just need to uh, choose A, B, C, or D. Which one won't be uh, able to recognize the skin biometric system? I have a question with the number six. The number six, I choose two or more or only one or just one? Uh, only one. Only one. Only one. Okay. Very good question. Okay. Well, now we are going to see. Let's see. Uh, question number one. Where does the TV show Las Vegas take place? In a casino, yes. right? In a casino. Okay. Very good. Number two. What is a face print? A code which identifies a face. It's letter A, right? Three. Identify two problems with 2D facial recognition from the list below. Two, right? Two problems. So the letter A and letter B, right? It is not effective if a picture is dark. The person in the photograph must face the camera. What is the problem with the 3D technology? Letter D, it cannot distinguish between identical twins. Let's see uh, number four. Uh, no, sorry, number five. Which two elements below can be measured by a skin biometric technology? Two, right? Two elements. The texture, someone's skin, and the existence of lines on the face. And which of these faces will the skin biometric system unable to identify? Letter A, right? The A is the correct one. Because you cannot see the whole face. Let's see. Uh, Miguel Angel, how many did you have correct? Two, teacher, only two. <laughs> <laughs> Not uh, possible. Why? Which ones? Which ones did you have correct? Which ones? In casino, in question either C, uh -huh. um, you enable uh, identify the image, the picture, and picture. Leader, C, uh, leader A in question six. Question, question six. six, right? Okay, six. question six. Okay, why do you think that you didn't have the correct ones, the, the previous one, the five, number four, number three, number two? What was the problem? Uh, in It's confused uh, in, uh, in sound, is, is my notes is uh, for parts. Uh, do you reading? Is I don't I don't uh, my things is uh, traduce the the words in in mm. paragraphs, but I I don't don't can is is traduction because I stop it. Uh, I understand. Uh, I so but very you, fast. You write you write the the your notes in Spanish or in English? In English. In English, but you try to yeah. translate, you try to, to understand is, it in Spanish, yes. like like what is he saying, what is he saying, que está diciendo, ah, de esto, de lo otro, uh -huh. you ah, write okay. words, right? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. In English, is is reading in English, because I, I my things is traducing in, in the You're moment. You're translating at the moment. Translating the moment, yes. I can imagine the effort, I can imagine the effort, you see? So uh, that's why I ask you, because... Probably I, I I might think probably he's not listening 
probably is the vocabulary, but his problem is that he's translating at the same time. So what you have yeah. to do is just to think in English all the time. Don't translate because that will Don't take translate. more time. Yes. yes, that will take more time. If you if you say, um, uh, uh, voy a decir, for example, in speaking that next week we are going to have speaking. So, for example, I'm going to say, a uh, mí me parece bien porque creo que está bien. How do I say that in English? I, I think it is okay. I think I am, it sounds good to me. Uh, how do I say it, right? Yes, how do I? It's, it's bad habit because I, I don't, don't it's quickly. Uh. Exactly. So what you have to do is just to have more English. Probably it's kind of difficult, I understand. But if you want to prepare for TOEFL in your case, specifically, you have to listen to it a lot. You need to a lot of vocabulary and you need to start thinking in English. You start mm -hmm. thinking it, not translation, not translate. Okay. That will take more time. Let's see, lady, how many did you have correct? Um, I got half and four and a half. Four and a half. That's good. Uh -huh. That's good. Did you take notes? Yes, I was taking notes. Okay, did they help? A lot. A lot, it's, exactly. Yeah. Because it's not testing your memory, right? It's just your understanding. Let's see mm -hmm. if lady understand what I'm going to say, right? That's what they think, right? And then a lady starts listening and getting all the information, main idea, words, keywords, right? And then you try to answer four is number four out of six is good, right? I think yes. that you passed the test. You passed the test. Let's see, Sirhan, how many did you have? Correct. Uh, the high, uh, number four. Four. Only four or just number four? No, no. Four. One, two, three, three and four. four. Okay, perfect. That's good also. Very good, Sirhan. Mm -hmm. Marielos, how many did you have? Correct. <laughs> Only one and two and a half. And a half. <laughs> two and a half. Two and a half. Yes. <laughs> okay. What was the problem in your case? Oh, yeah, I was confused about the 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 question. Um, I it's difficult to me, but for the speed, the yes. the conversation. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Probably in the in your case will be like sometimes you get confused because of the words probably. So we need to practice a lot of, of vocabulary and listening, a lot of listening, right? Sarah Martinez, what did you have in your case? How many did you have correct? Sarah, are you there, Sarah? Probably she has issues with their connection. Okay, we are going to check the next listening because we are almost finishing you see <laughs> it's really fast so uh next we are going uh to check sergio nelsi katia irena juan jose maritza let's see how many they have correct for the next listening okay we will have do you want to practice with a conversation or with another lecture which one do you want to try this time for me, lecture. Teacher. Lecture. Yes, yes lectures yes. are kind of more difficult, right? Conversations, probably tomorrow we will have a combination, but tomorrow we will have time, okay? Mañana vamos con tiempo. So we will have like four listenings and you will have like this, you will you will be like this, right? We won't have time to, to speak that much. So yes. uh, let's see. This is a TOEFL about anthropology anthropology what is anthropology anthropology right but what is it about are you familiar with that yes it's a it's a science that studies the how it's called the rings the um, historic um mm -hmm. yes. I can find. you see that's it's why Science. Yes, anthropología. What? What? In, in in Spanish, it's kind of difficult to define because uh -huh. we don't use this vocabulary. But it's but the it has study to do with fossils. Of the bomb. Yes, it's the study of human societies human. and mm. cultures okay. and cultures and their development. So you see, that's why we need to uh, have vocabulary. So we are going to listen yeah. something related to human societies in cultures and development okay so now we have an idea we are going to play the lecture 
this is this kind of loan. So I don't know if we are going to me be able to to play it twice, but I will try. Okay, I will play it right now. And I think that we have one, two, three, four, five, six questions. Okay. 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 Ready? Mm -hmm. Ready. Okay, let's listen to you. Yes. Let's take notes, please. In this lecture series, we're going to look at the most prominent anthropologists, those who have really helped the subject to what it is now. With this in mind, we definitely can't ignore the work of Franz Uri Boas, a German anthropologist born in 1858, who is generally known as the father of American anthropology. Before we can consider Boas's contribution, we need to look at the state anthropology was in before he came onto the scene. Although there was some serious work being done in anthropology at the time, the field was heavily peopled with untrained adventurers and armchair philosophers. Racial bias and bigotry was rampant. It was common practice for practitioners to put forward their own pet theories, grand sweeping theories, in which they prognosticated on the nature of man. As for evidence, well, they used small scraps of information haphazardly gathered and riddled with bias to back up the point they wanted to make. Boas's background countered this. His upbringing was liberal. His parents held a disdain for dogma, religious or otherwise, which meant that Boas was free to question different beliefs unhindered. He was attracted to the natural sciences and would collect minerals and seashells. As he grew older, he did more rigorous studies and experiments, and at university, he studied an eclectic mix of mathematics, physics, and geography. What put him on the anthropological track was a geographical expedition to the Arctic that he took in 1883. Fascinated by the people, their appearance, their language, their traditions and way of life, he came home adamant to make anthropology his life work. This background was, I think it's fair to say, fundamental with regards to what Boas brought to the field, because he introduced methodology and scientific rigor into the discipline. Scientific method dictated that you could only formulate theories and conclusions after thorough and rigorous data collection and the examination of hard evidence. Accurate conclusions required careful observation, and even these could and should be critiqued and restudied, in case sloppiness or bias had skewed the results. One of Boas's main contributions to anthropological thought was his rejection of the evolutionary approach to culture. This approach assumed that all societies progressed through certain technological and cultural stages, in hierarchical form, until they reached the peak, the zenith, which of course was the Western European culture. An example was the progression from a maternalistic to a paternalistic culture. According to Boas, this was all bunkum. There was no process towards a so-called higher form of culture. Each society, he said, was uniquely adapted to the set of circumstances in which it had arisen. Each was the product of a unique and particular history. It wasn't halfway along the road to a lofty idea of civilization. It had already arrived. In this way, his ideas paralleled those of Charles Darwin, whose own conception of evolution was that change occurred in response to pressures and opportunities, and that the path of change could vary in a multitude of ways. For example, when Darwin surveyed the Galapagos, he did not deem the one variation of a species superior to another simply because it was larger or its markings more elaborate. Rather, he saw them all simply as unique adaptations to their own particular circumstances. This idea was what shaped Boas's work in museums, for which he was, at first, heavily criticized. At the time, museums were laid out in this very way. Cultures considered primitive were set out first, and then gradually, more so-called advanced or higher cultures were set out in progression. But Boas rejected that. He insisted that museums focus on the cultural proximity of the groups in question. Boas also did a lot of work to destroy preconceived ideas of racism. Racial anthropologists of the day believed that human behavior was determined by an innate disposition. Boas worked to disprove this, asserting that behavior was the result of social learning. He also worked on physiological preconceptions. At the time, it was believed that head shape was a stable racial trait. Presumably, they were under the impression that Western Europeans naturally had larger brains and so were more intelligent. But Boas conducted a series of groundbreaking studies of skeletal anatomy, which knocked this idea on its head, concluding that cranial shape and size was highly malleable and depended on environmental factors such as health and nutrition. 
For Boas, the aim of anthropology was to understand how their experiences, their environment, their social learning led people to understand and interact with the world in different ways. And to do this, it was essential to gain complete understanding of the people's cultural practices. You couldn't just observe them from a distance through the eyes of your own culture. You needed to look at a whole range of things. It's mythology and tribal lore, religion, social taboos, marriage customs, physical appearance, diet, handicrafts, means of obtaining food, and so on. To do this, anthropologists had no choice but to go on location, learn the language, and undertake an intense survey that cataloged all these different elements. As the burden of the task of studying culture grew, anthropology became divided into four distinct parts. Human evolution, archaeology, language, and culture. In short, Boas left behind a considerable legacy to the field of anthropology. In terms of his scientific methodology, his cultural relativism, and his tireless efforts to end racial bigotry and oppression. He also did a great deal of fieldwork himself among indigenous groups, and inspired multiple generations of anthropologists to study and record the vanishing cultures of so many tribal peoples, especially Native Americans and Pacific Islanders, which has gained more and more significance over time as globalization blots out more and more indigenous cultures, perhaps forever. In this lecture series, we're going Okay, it was kind of long, right? Uh, do you yeah. want to listen to it again, or that's okay? Again. Mm. <laughs> again, again right? We can try, okay. teacher. Let's try one more time, okay? Because it's really fun, right, to listen to it, okay? Very good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very good. Let's listen to it again. Okay. I'm going to look at the most prominent anthropologists, those who have really helped the subject to what it is now. With this in mind, we definitely can't ignore the work of Franz Uri Boas, a German anthropologist born in 1858, who is generally known as the father of American anthropology. Before we can consider Boas's contribution, we need to look at the state anthropology was in before he came onto the scene. Although there was some serious work being done in anthropology at the time, the field was heavily peopled with untrained adventurers and armchair philosophers. Racial bias and bigotry was rampant. It was common practice for practitioners to put forward their own pet theories, grand sweeping theories, in which they prognosticated on the nature of man. As for evidence, well, they used small scraps of information haphazardly gathered and riddled with bias to back up the point they wanted to make. Boas's background countered this. His upbringing was liberal. His parents held a disdain for dogma, religious or otherwise, which meant that Boas was free to question different beliefs unhindered. He was attracted to the natural sciences and would collect minerals and seashells. As he grew older, he did more rigorous studies and experiments, and at university he studied an eclectic mix of mathematics, physics, and geography. What put him on the anthropological track was a geographical expedition to the Arctic that he took in 1883. Fascinated by the people, their appearance, their language, their traditions and way of life, he came home adamant to make anthropology his life work. This background was, I think it's fair to say, fundamental with regards to what Boas brought to the field, because he introduced methodology and scientific rigor into the discipline. Scientific method dictated that you could only formulate theories and conclusions after thorough and rigorous data collection and the examination of hard evidence. Accurate conclusions required careful observation, and even these could and should be critiqued and restudied, in case sloppiness or bias had skewed the results. One of Boas's main contributions to anthropological thought was his rejection of the evolutionary approach to culture. This approach assumed that all societies progress through certain technological and cultural stages, in hierarchical form, until they reach the peak, the zenith, which of course was the Western European culture. An example was the progression from a maternalistic to a paternalistic culture. According to Boas, this was all bunkum. There was no process towards a so-called higher form of culture. Each society, he said, was uniquely adapted to the set of circumstances in which it had arisen. Each was the product of a unique and particular history. It wasn't halfway along the road to a lofty idea of civilization. It had already arrived. In this way, his ideas paralleled those of Charles Darwin, whose own conception of evolution was that change occurred in response to pressures and opportunities. 
and that the path of change could vary in a multitude of ways. For example, when Darwin surveyed the Galapagos, he did not deem the one variation of a species superior to another, simply because it was larger or its markings more elaborate. Rather, he saw them all simply as unique adaptations to their own particular circumstances. This idea was what shaped Boas's work in museums, for which he was, at first, heavily criticized. At the time, museums were laid out in this very way. Cultures considered primitive were set out first, and then gradually, more so-called advanced or higher cultures were set out in progression. But Boas rejected that. He insisted that museums focus on the cultural proximity of the groups in question. Boas also did a lot of work to destroy preconceived ideas of racism. Racial anthropologists of the day believed that human behavior was determined by an innate disposition. Boas worked to disprove this, asserting that behavior was the result of social learning. He also worked on physiological preconceptions. At the time, it was believed that head shape was a stable racial trait. Presumably, they were under the impression that Western Europeans naturally had larger brains and so were more intelligent. But Boas conducted a series of groundbreaking studies of skeletal anatomy, which knocked this idea on its head, concluding that cranial shape and size was highly malleable and depended on environmental factors such as health and nutrition. For Boas, the aim of anthropology was to understand how their experiences, their environment, their social learning led people to understand and interact with the world in different ways. And to do this, it was essential to gain complete understanding of the people's cultural practices. You couldn't just observe them from a distance through the eyes of your own culture. You needed to look at a whole range of things, its mythology and tribal lore, religion, social taboos, marriage customs, physical appearance, diet, handicrafts, means of obtaining food, and so on. To do this, anthropologists had no choice but to go on location, learn the language, and undertake an intense survey that cataloged all these different elements. As the burden of the task of studying culture grew, anthropology became divided into four distinct parts human evolution, archaeology, language, and culture. In short, Boas left behind a considerable legacy to the field of anthropology, in terms of his scientific methodology, his cultural relativism, and his tireless efforts to end racial bigotry and oppression. He also did a great deal of fieldwork himself among indigenous groups, and inspired multiple generations of anthropologists to study and record the vanishing cultures of so many tribal peoples especially Native Americans and Pacific Islanders, which has gained more and more significance over time as globalization blots out more and more indigenous cultures, perhaps forever. Okay, perfect. Was complicated, right? Kind of complicated. Now we are going to uh, answer these questions. Uh, please help me, everybody. Number one, which of the following characterized anthropological study before the time of Franz Boas. Few people were interested or involved in anthropological study. Anthropologists were not expected to support their claims with evidence. Anthropology was not studied seriously or data was not collected in a systematic and objective way. Which one? I think letter C. Mm -hmm. Letter C, A, B, C. This one, anthropology was not studied seriously? I, I think yeah. that number two. Number, number two? two? Number two? Okay, let's yes. choose number two. Let's see. Number two. <laughs> number two is incorrect. <laughs> another try. Another try. And number four. <laughs> number four, anthropology number was not four. studied seriously, see? <clears throat> Or four. Incorrect. Incorrect. No, number four. Number four. four. Data was not collected in a systematic objective way. Yes, that's the correct one. Very good. Very good. Let's see. Next one. Let's see. How did Boas's early life influence his work in anthropology? His religious upbringing meant that he was respectful to people from other backgrounds. His fondness for collecting things inspired him to gather artifacts from little known culture. His li liberal upbringing helped him to understand different cultures or his scientific studies ensure that he approached experiments systematically. Mm, number three. Number three. Number three, number this three. one. Okay, number three. 
Incorrect. Incorrect. Number four. <laughs> number four. Let's see. Number four. No, no. Correct. No. <laughs> number, four. Yes. Let's see. Right. number four. Number four. Let's see. Three. Example. Example. We, Why? Say, we say team Marin de dos <laughs> Yeah, it's like in the exam, right? In the exam. <laughs> Number three. Why is Charles Darwin mentioned in the talk? Darwin's work in natural sciences inspired by Boas to study the world around him. Both Darwin and Boas believe that individuals change according to their situations. Darwin and Boas both went on expeditions to study human societies. Or both Boas and Darwin believe that humans evolve along a fixed route towards civilization. Number two. Three. Number two. Two. Number two. two. Correct. Very good. You, you see? Finally. Finally. You see? <laughs> yes, Number four. Let's see. Why did Boas object to about museums? The type of artifacts that were on display, the fact that certain cultures were not represented. The fact that some cultures were not considered important or the order in which the displays were laid out. I think number one. Number one. Number one. Let's see. No. No. That some cultures. The number fact two. that some number cultures. Three. Number mm -hmm. three. Let's see. No. Number two. Number two. Let's see. Number two. <laughs> number four. No, oh. it's number four number again. Four. Oh. Number four. No, the order in which the sisters <laughs> were laid out. Five. We almost finished. What did Boas prove about head shape? Intelligence is not linked to the head shape and size. Injuries to the head can alter its shape and size. People in some cultures had larger brains than those in others. The shape and size of people's head is not predetermined. Number three. Number three. 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 Number, three. Number one. Yeah. No. <laughs> Number one. Number no. Two. Number, Number two. two. Number two. Number four. Number four. Yeah. Number, Number four. four. Yeah. Number four. The shape and size of people's heads is not predetermined. What did Boas make people realize? To study a culture, one can be a member of it. Anthropology is broad and covers multiple disciplines. Cultures can be effectively studied at a distance. Many indigenous indigenous cultures were being lost to globalization. Number four. Number two. Number, Number four, two. 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 Four. Number two. <laughs> Very good. Correct. Number two. Anthropology is broad and covers multiple disciplines. At we least that one. Two of okay. six. Two six. Two six, kind of, kind of. If so mm -hmm. we have to, uh, that, this one was difficult, actually. This one was really difficult. Yeah. So um, tomorrow we will have shorter passages, mañana más cortos, but with time, con tiempo. No van a tener okay. tanto tiempo. Okay, so one after the other. Tomorrow we will study that. And that will okay. be the last practice, okay? So don't worry mm -hmm. about listening yeah. anymore. Okay. This, uh, <laughs> this, the, this one has... Uh, too too much uh, technical terms. Yes, exactly. So we are going to, for that reason tomorrow. Vamos a hacer algo diferente mañana. Not that okay. long, not tan largas. Okay. So okay. let's see how you feel tomorrow. Okay. Okay, teacher. Okay. <laughs> so I will see you tomorrow at seven fifty-five mm. and have a nice evening. Okay. Okay. Good night, evening. Thank you. Good night, Good night everybody. Good night. Bye. Good night. Bye.